Everyone, thank you for joining us today. I have Heidi Martell here. Um, she's a cannabis nurse who we've been working with for so many years. And so thank you, Heidi, for taking the time to do this live with us. We really appreciate it. Um, Heidi has been working in, um, with, in cannabis for a few years now. Um, and she does consultations with patients with various different ailments. Um, and so we've obviously have worked with her for the past few years and um, we've gotten such great feedback from a lot of our customers on um, you know, the, the regimens and the, the, the advice that they get from Heidi. So today Heidi's gonna be discussing mainly cannabis and brain cancers. Um, and so I'll let Heidi kind of take over. Um, so thank you so much Heidi again for joining us. All right, so thank you. So um, before I go ahead and kind of get started with a brief intro um, and get into the talk, um, in the interest of full disclosure, we ended up having some unforeseen work that's being done at my home and my home office today. So um, what I did do is pre-record the audio for the talk today so that there won't be any interruptions, um, noise, anything like that. I will still be absolutely available for questions after the talk. And so in a few moments, I'll go ahead and mute myself and get that going. Um, but I want you to know the talk will last about 40 minutes, just a little over. Um, I do encourage you to stay for the entire talk if at all possible. Um, we are going to start off with a little bit more of review of the evidence that we have, some of the science and addressing a really important study that came out um, in the last couple of years that is very important to address when we look at certain types of cancer treatments um, and cannabis. And then we're going to move into more about foods, herbs, things that can also be helpful as adjunctive treatment alongside cannabis and traditional cancer therapies. And we're going to end with a really, really important part of cannabis's therapeutic properties when we're looking at cannabis and cancer that's very rarely addressed by a lot of clinicians. And it's been highlighted by one of my mentors, Dr. Dustin Sulak. And so I really encourage you, if you can stick with me, that would be wonderful. Um, if you have questions throughout the talk, we're going to have Ingrid, thank you, monitoring the chat for us to try and answer some of those questions. And then at the end of the talk, um, I'll go ahead and turn my camera and mic back on and I'll start looking and answering some of those for you as well. Okay, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. If for any reason there are technical glitches that come throughout the presentation, I will address those in the Q&A, so fear not if that were to happen. Um, so it seems that everything has been running smooth me, smoothly, and uh, I'm grateful to have you here. So we'll go ahead and get started. So I would like to thank Ingrid and Diana for your work on the presentation and thank you Diana for the introduction. So again, you can see on the left hand side my information. My name is Heidi Martell, I'm the owner of Cleaver Canada Consulting and Coaching and you can see my email and website there. Please feel free to reach out with questions or navigate to my website to learn a little bit more about me and the services that I offer. And we do have a lot to cover today, so I'm just going to say let's go ahead and get started and jump in. So just a quick summary of what we know thus far in regard to high-grade gliomas and glioblastoma in particular. Um, we absolutely know that there are several cases where we've seen significant improvement in patients and clients who've had a poor prognosis with high-grade gliomas. However, the specific mechanism by which cannabinoids produce their therapeutic effects really do still remain the subject of ongoing scientific exploration. We absolutely do know that cannabinoid receptor 1 and cannabinoid receptor 2, CB1 and CB2, are expressed in human gliomas. In addition, our research does suggest that both plant-based cannabinoids, including CBD, CBG, THC, and others, in addition to synthetic versions, as well as endocannabinoids, can be potent inhibitors of brain cancer cell development and can lead to apoptosis or death of existing tumor cells. From this study back in 2018, we were able to see uh, the authors concluded that the therapeutic effect of cannabinoids is based on reduction of tumor growth via inhibition of tumor proliferation and angiogenesis, but also via induction of tumor cell death. 
So preventing the spread of the tumor, starving off blood supply to the tumor, as well as um, creating that tumor cell death or apoptosis. The authors go on to state, additionally, cannabinoids were shown to inhibit the invasiveness and stem cell-like properties of glioblastoma tumors. And we see re recent phase two clinical trials that indicate positive results regarding the survival of glioblastoma patients upon cannabinoid treatment. Looking at this 2021 phase 1b randomized placebo controlled trial, uh, we do see that a one to one ratio of whole plant extract THC to CBD in combination with the chemotherapy temozolomide does in fact produce therapeutic and synergistic effects in patients with recurrent glioblastoma. I decided to include this one particular case study that's looking at um, CBD alone as treatment for malignant brain tumors. And I wanted to include this because it's important to understand that although we hear about THC and CBG and a lot of other cannabinoids, um, cannabinoid dosing for gliomas as well as for any other um, diseases and conditions really is an individualized um, process. And this study highlights the fact that CBD alone inhibits brain cancer cell proliferation and modulates apoptosis via oxidative stress. So in this particular study, patients were receiving only CBD, a daily dose of 400 milligrams, in conjunction with standard therapeutic procedure, which in this study was surgical resection followed by radiation. So it's important to understand that not every person responds to a particular cannabinoid or combination of cannabinoids uh, regarding their particular diagnosis. Um, and this study just helps to highlight that. In addition, I just wanted to mention that CBD also does have synergistic effects we know of with the chemotherapies carmustine um, or cisplatin in conjunction with radiation. And these have both led to creating glioma cell death. In one of the prior studies, we saw the one-to-one -one ratio of CBD to THC could be helpful in combination with temozolomide in recurrent glioblastoma. And now we have another study looking at cannabigerol as a potential therapeutic agent in a novel combined therapy for glioblastoma. So here, um, the authors look at uh, CBD, CBG, and THC. And in their summary here, they state that the known psychoactive effects of THC hamper its medical applications in these patients with potential cognitive impairment due to the progression of disease. Therefore, non-toxic cannabigerol, being recently shown to exhibit anti-tumor properties in some carcinomas, is assayed here for the first time in glioblastoma with the aim to replace THC. And they go on to state, we indeed found CBG to effectively impair the relevant hallmarks of glioblastoma progression with comparable killing effects to THC and in addition, inhibiting the invasion of glioblastoma cells. Moreover, CBG can destroy therapy resistant glioblastoma stem cells, which are the root of cancer development and extremely resistant to various other treatments of this lethal cancer. And so they really go on to suggest here that CBG should present a new yet unexplored adjuvant treatment strategy of glioblastoma. And the important thing in this study here to highlight for me is that we see CBG having comparable killing effects to THC. And to go into just a little bit more detail in this particular study, it's important to note that they were using purified natural cannabinoids in this particular study. And they did show that combining CBD with CBG was more efficient than with THC. And so here they've gone on to demonstrate that THC has little added value in combined cannabinoid glioblastoma treatment. And the authors go on to suggest here that um, this psychotropic cannabinoid THC should possibly be replaced with CBG in future clinical trials of glioblastoma therapy. In addition to showing that CBD and CBG do mediate cytotoxic effects on glioblastoma, differentiated and stem cells, the authors were able to deduce different ratios of CBD to CBG based on what would be most efficient for killing differentiated cells that are existing, as well as what would be most efficient in killing glioblastoma stem cells, so as new growth begins. And so those ratios 
were shown that uh, a one to four ratio of CBD to CBG was most effective in killing differentiated glioblastoma cells. So we see here CBG has the greater um, tumor killing property. When we're looking at glioblastoma stem cells, we see a three to one ratio of CBD to CBG to be most efficient in killing those glioblastoma stem cells. Uh, so that CBD here is gonna be the bigger player, but having CBG um, involved is also important to achieve that effect. So just to wrap up some of the groundbreaking research that we've seen in regard to CBG and glioblastoma, um, we see confirmation that multi-compound cannabinoid formulations are more effective than single cannabinoid preparations. And that is the entourage effect that we often um, read about and hear people talking about. Um, we also see that um, adding CBG to CBD can double the cytotoxic effect on glioblastoma cells at times and in some patients and clients. And we also see the power of CBG and CBD on their own, having the ability to induce apoptosis that is sufficient without the need for THC. Now, I'm not by any means demonizing THC because this is an extremely effective medicine and cannabinoid in the use of many types of cancers, including glioblastoma. However, in uh, brain tumors, high-grade gliomas, some of our patients and clients are not able to tolerate the psychotropic effects of THC. And in addition, we also know that high-dose THC at times can possibly weaken the immune system, and this could possibly lessen the therapeutic effect of immunotherapies. Speaking of cannabinoids and the immune system, that brings us to the really important question of the hour, which is cannabis and immunotherapy for cancer, are they compatible? And so this is a really good article put out by Project CBD. I encourage you to look it up and give it a read. They do have all the studies linked at the end of this um, article. And we're gonna go on to talk about those in a little more detail. So this 2019 study highlights the importance of reading beyond the study title and sometimes even beyond the abstract that is provided. So what we see here is although cannabis use during immunotherapy treatment did decrease response rate to immunotherapy, it did not affect progression-free survival or overall survival. And it's also important to note that cannabis often helps clients better tolerate the inflammation and other side effects of immunotherapy so that they're able to continue their treatment as planned without dosing reductions or having to shorten their treatment protocols. Now in 2020, we saw this study, uh, which was entitled Cannabis Consumption Used by Cancer Patients During Immunotherapy Correlates with Poor Clinical Outcome. Now, this was a study that was done by a very reputable team in Israel and something that I even presented on myself. And we are gonna go ahead and break down this study in just a, a few moments here to reveal some serious flaws um, that really do affect the conclusions drawn by this particular study. So just to break down this study a bit, um, the most important thing to know um, is that the next few slides I'm gonna present um, were taken from a presentation by uh, Dr. Mikhail Kogan, who went through this particular study and pointed out some of the serious flaws that were contained within and um, has allowed us to question some of those conclusions. So some of the important um, or the most important thing to take from this particular slide is that there was no information provided here about what extract products were used or what amounts of THC or CBD were used. Of note on this slide, we want to look at the numbers of non-cannabis users and immunotherapy given as a first line or second line treatment. So we see with the non-cannabis users, there are roughly equal amounts of patients who are being given immunotherapy as a first line treatment and as a second line treatment. Now, when we move to the second column and look at cannabis users, we see only eight patients who are being given immunotherapy as a first line treatment 
and 26 patients being given immunotherapy as a second line treatment. And the significance here is that um, being given immunotherapy as a second line treatment is indicative of the fact that these patients have much more advanced disease when they're receiving immunotherapy as a second line treatment. So their disease is much more advanced than if they're being given the immunotherapy as a first line treatment. So Dr. Kogan's initial conclusion is that, as we stated on that previous slide, cannabis users were sicker, they were more ill, and thereby had more progressed disease and had a poorer response to treatment. And that um, you know, despite the fact that there was a post-study correction to adjust for the severe difference in high frequency of liver metastasis outcome in the cannabis users, um, the researchers reported that the difference in mortality persisted. However, this is not a conclusion that can be made. Uh, Dr. Kogan points out that in order to adjust statistics properly, the total number of patients would need to stay the same, or the entire power analysis and entire study should be repeated. And this is definitely what we propose. Um, if you remove the liver metastasis patients from the analysis, we see a completely imbalanced comparison where we have 55 non-cannabis users to only 11 cannabis users. The second important conclusion drawn by Dr. Kogan is in the very fine details at the bottom, which shows that the cannabis user's mortality plateaued around the 12 month mark, and actually 25% of patients continued to survive past that 12 month mark without any further deaths. Now this is in comparison to the non-cannabis users who continued to die even after that 12 month mark. So what do we tell our patients given the information presented in this study? Uh, Dr. Kogan reached out to Dr. Donald Abrams, who's a veteran in our field, and Dr. Abrams said, my biggest concern is a significant difference in line of therapy with non-users getting immunotherapy as first line and users, meaning cannabis users, getting second or third line, which means they are less likely to respond. In the piece, Dr. Abrams goes on to say, he, meaning one of the study authors updated for my JNCI session, said that they adjusted for that and that the survival difference held. Dr. Abrams goes on to say, I just find it unbelievable, but I do inform my immunotherapy patients of the, spine, of the finding despite not believing it. So what do I do in my practice? I let my patients know that it's advisable to use caution when taking cannabis medicine on immunotherapy days as there's mixed evidence on the therapeutic outcomes. Now, when we say cannabis medicine or cannabis, most often we're referring to THC because as we referenced earlier, um, it's really high doses of THC that we see that have the potential to lower uh, the immune system or weaken it to some degree, which can work at cross purposes with immunotherapy treatments whose goal is to strengthen the immune system to fight the cancer. Now, since there is mixed evidence regarding the combination of cannabis and immunotherapy, I tell my patients that it's advisable to use the lowest possible therapeutic doses of cannabis and THC in particular, and to possibly hold THC cannabis medicine on immunotherapy days, and sometimes the day before and after an immunotherapy infusion. Now, one of my mentors, Dr. Dustin Sulak, um, his recommendation and what he tells his patients uh, is that he recommends withholding cannabis, generally speaking, THC, two days prior and seven days after an immunotherapy infusion. So that's one last point I want to make in regard to this particular study, and that's the table here that shows reported immune-related adverse events. So I alluded to that earlier in that uh, cannabis does help our clients and our patients often better tolerate the side effects of immunotherapy. We see a lot of inflammation that sometimes can lead to what's called cytokine storm that can lead to cessation of treatment. And what we see here in this table is that the non-cannabis users have experienced far greater negative or intolerable side effects compared to the cannabis users. And so we really do see the proof here that cannabis does help our patients and our clients better tolerate their immunotherapy treatments. 
To conclude the portion of this talk focusing on medical cannabis and immunotherapy, we do have a new study that came out in February of this year, 2023, entitled The Use of Medical Cannabis Concomitantly with Immune, Immune Checkpoint Inhibitors in Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer, a Sigh of Relief. And so in a nutshell, what this study shows us is that immunotherapy, in this case, pembrolizumab, in conjunction with medical cannabis, when taken together, do not show any deleterious effects in the clinical setting, in this case for non-small cell lung cancer. And so there's definitely a lot more research that needs to be done. However, this most recent study is encouraging in showing that having the combination of medical cannabis and immunotherapy on board did not lead to harmful effects and did not lead to worse treatment outcomes. Okay, so we're going to shift gears a little bit here and we're going to talk about terpenes, essential oils, and foods that may be helpful to use in conjunction with traditional treatment, cannabinoid therapy, uh, when we're looking at high-grade gliomas, uh, recurrent glioblastomas, and the like. So what we do see is that a more significant effect may be produced, so a more synergistic effect when we combine cannabinoids such as CBD, CBG, THC with terpenes or essential oils or foods that contain those terpenes and essential oils. Um, and so for example, we do have two human trials that discover that parallel alcohol, which is the precursor to the terpene limonene, which is commonly found in the cannabis plant, um, that combining those produce therapeutic effects in human glioma patients. Now, sources of limonene uh, in foods come from citrus, so lemons, oranges, mandarins, grapefruit, uh, rosemary, chamomile, ginger, turmeric, red pepper, fennel, valerian, hops, and many, many more. Um, citrus is obviously going to be one of the most abundant sources and the only thing to keep in mind here is uh, that grapefruit sometimes is advised to be avoided due to some potential interactions and so we might not want to have grapefruit as one of those um, essential oils or terpenes that are added to um, our diet or to our medicine. And also looking at the study um, you can see that we're talking about some fairly high doses of these terpenes or this monoterpene in this particular case, and that it was being delivered intranasally. Another terpene that can have some anti-cancer and antioxidant properties um, for those with high-grade gliomas and glioblastoma uh, is called terpeneline. And we see this is a study looking at rat brain cells, and a lot of our studies, as you know, come from animal studies, laboratory studies, small human trials, um, case reports, and the like. But what we can see here is that in addition to limonene, results from this laboratory trial demonstrated that the nasal administration of terpeneline similarly produced potent anti-proliferative effects against rat brain tumor cells. And so terpeneline we can get um, in our diet through apples, cumin, nutmeg, tea tree, sage, rosemary, turmeric, cardamom, and lilac, among others. And so this is another way that we can introduce some of these foods and essential oils into our daily treatment regimen to try and help bolster and achieve those synergistic therapeutic effects alongside our cannabinoid therapy and our traditional therapy. We also often see limited penetration of our chemotherapeutic agents through the blood-brain barrier and the blood tumor barrier. However, we see that the terpene borneol combined with the Chinese herbal medicine tetrandrine can help improve the survival and therapeutic efficacy of the chemotherapeutic agent 5-FU in mice with brain metastases. And they do this through modulating the blood brain and blood tumor barriers. Now you can source borneol from food and from herbs such as rosemary, ginger, 
thyme, mint, mugwort, camphor, and tetrandrine, as I stated earlier, is a traditional Chinese herbal medicine that can be found as a supplement. And this is just one more research article that shows that natural borneol has the potential to sensitize human glioma cells to cisplatin-induced apoptosis, which provides potential application in the clinic. And this 2018 study shows natural borneol as a novel chemosensitizer that enhances temozolomide-induced anti-cancer efficiency against human gliomas. Building upon the 2011 study of parallel alcohol and glioblastoma, we have this 2018 study. Just a reminder, the monoterpene parallel alcohol is the precursor to the terpene limonene, which is commonly found in cannabis. And in this particular study, it was a little bit surprising that parallel alcohol failed to produce the therapeutic outcomes that were expected when given orally. And um, it also produced some difficult to tolerate gastrointestinal side effects. However, when given intranasally, the parallel alcohol yielded some very promising activity in recurrent glioblastoma patients and was also well tolerated. And so with this in mind, it seems to indicate that inhalation may generally be the best method to cross the blood-brain barrier to get those medications um, into the brain and that ingestion may not be nearly as effective. And so since we have um, some conflicting evidence and not nearly enough to draw some definitive conclusions, in my practice, I recommend that my clients add foods that contain these therapeutic terpenes to their diet, as well as using inhalation of essential oils. And if you recall, um, sources of limonene, terpenaline, and borneol can all be found in rosemary. And this is why I often recommend um, the inhalation or diffusion of rosemary oil uh, throughout the day to my clients and patients. Um, an added benefit of rosemary oil, just as an FYI, is that it can really help with focus as well as can help counteract some of the psychoactive effects of THC. So there can be some really good benefits to adding the inhalation of rosemary oil to your daily regimen, as well as adding rosemary to your cooking and your diet uh, when we're looking at the potential for therapeutic benefit with high-grade gliomas. Now, you've probably all heard the mention of curcumin as being an anti-cancer supplement. So curcumin sourced from turmeric has also been shown specifically to decrease the malignant characteristics of glioblastoma stem cells via induction of reactive oxygen species. And I believe in this particular study, they were looking at a dosage of about 250 milligrams per day of curcumin added to the diet. Next, we look at niacin as a supplement that has been shown in this particular study to be an immune stimulator against glioblastoma. Now here they show that niacin exposed monocytes attenuated the growth of brain tumor initiating cells derived from glioblastoma patients by producing anti-proliferative interferon alpha 14. And building upon this is another study that is currently in progress looking at niacin, which is also known as vitamin B3. We're looking at niacin here, a dose of 500 milligrams per day of a controlled release supplement in combination with radiation and temozolomide. Now, it's important to mention this slow release formula as it tends to reduce a lot of the unwanted flushing side effects that one can often get from using niacin as a supplement. Moving on, we have a 2021 study that's looking at the therapeutic potential of selenium in glioblastoma. 
Now, what this study shows is that micronutrients such as selenium may have positive effects in glioblastoma treatment. And just of note, selenium is an essential micronutrient that has antioxidative and anti-cancer properties. And there is some evidence showing selenium deficiency in patients who are suffering from brain malignancies, such as glioblastoma. Next, we have a very recent study that looks at the antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties of the constituents in walnuts. And this study shows that there is potential anti-cancer and antioxidant properties of walnuts and that they may be incorporated into the diet in order to provide some possible therapeutic benefits. This next study shows the possibility of how limiting arginine in the diet may help target glioblastoma cells. So here we see that arginine deprivation demonstrated impaired cell proliferation, invasiveness, and viability in glioblastoma. Now, if we want to try to limit arginine in the diet, sources of arginine are meat, particularly red meat, chicken, and turkey, fish, particularly salmon and haddock, nuts and seeds, almonds, cashews, and pumpkin seeds in particular, legumes, in particular soybeans and chickpeas, whole grains such as brown rice and oats, and dairy products such as milk, yogurt, and cheese. This 2022 study looks at glioblastoma and methionine addiction. And the study points to the fact that restricting methionine in the diet may help to starve glioblastoma cells. Now, if we're looking at starving cancer with methionine restriction, the elements in our diet that contain the most amount of methionine are chicken and fish. After that, milk, red meat, and eggs. And if you really do want to stick with lower methionine foods, we'd be looking at eating fruits, nuts, vegetables, grains, and beans. Now, of course, there may be some conflicting information if we're trying to restrict arginine and trying to restrict methionine. And so we have to just keep in mind that uh, recommendations for diet may change over time as new information becomes available, and you may have to make some choices about what elements resonate the most with you in terms of what you wish to include or restrict from your diet. And I've included just one more study here from 2022 as well uh, that points to the fact that methionine restriction has been shown to be highly effective against all major cancer types and can also work synergistically with chemotherapy. Next, we're moving on to look at the activation of natural killer cells by probiotics. And this 2016 study is important in that well-functioning natural killer cells are needed in order to bolster the immune system in cancer patients. And the role of probiotics activated natural killer cells are to promote the adaptive immune response against pathogens. Fast forward to 2022, looking at this study, Defective patient natural killer function is reversed by AJ2 probiotic bacteria or addition of allogeneic healthy monocytes. And so the oral ingestion of the AJ2 probiotic resulted in the better functioning of natural killer cells, which are necessary to bolster in cancer patients. So this seems to indicate that for successful natural killer cell immunotherapy, both the defect in the natural killer cells and those in the monocytes should be corrected. And this particular AJ2 probiotic bacteria may be very therapeutic in providing adjunctive treatment strategies. Now we're just gonna move on to a few 
pharmaceuticals that have been around for quite some time that can also have some surprising anti-cancer properties. And we definitely see brain cancer killing activities in certain psychiatric medications. We see that mood disorders such as depression have been implicated in immune pathways and they're known to provoke the inflammatory responses. And prolonged immune dysregulation can compromise the repair capacity of these exposed cells, potentially contributing to genetic instability and mutations, alterations in DNA repair, and the inhibition of apoptosis. So we see that immune dysregulation can also lead to a worse prognosis in several cancers. In addition, depression and distress are also associated with markers of increased inflammation, which can also worsen a person's cancer prognosis. And here is a summary of representative psychiatric medications with some potential anti-cancer activity in glioblastoma and other types of gliomas. And here is one last study looking at a psychiatric medication and glioblastoma, which looks at combining fluoxetine or Prozac with temozolomide and was shown to cause massive increases in glioblastoma cell death and complete tumor regression in mice. We even see the use of gabapentin, often prescribed for chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, and even some antihypertensive pharmaceuticals that work to decrease glioblastoma proliferation. Even certain types of antihistamines may help to overcome immunotherapy resistance in cancer and brain tumor patients. And these are the H1 antihistamines, commonly known drugs such as Benadryl, Claritin, Allegra, Zyrtec, and Zizol. And I wanna close out this discussion by talking about one of the most important aspects of cannabis as medicine for use in cancer patients and those with brain tumors that's rarely often talked about and addressed, but is so very important. And this is cannabis's ability to improve quality of life, to help with sleep, to help reduce anxiety, reduce pain, to help acknowledge the potential end of life, and sometimes even the addition of psychedelics such as psilocybin mushrooms in micro or macro dosing. When we use these medicines to improve quality of life and to improve these symptoms and side effects of treatment and disease, we see improvements in therapeutic outcomes and overall survival. And just to circle back to CBG, which we started off talking a lot about earlier in this talk, CBG is a very potent agonist at the trp one channel, which is linked to cancer pain. And so not only THC, CBD, and CBDA can be helpful in reducing inflammation and helping with the pain of disease, the pain and side effects of treatment, but CBG is an extremely important cannabinoid to have on board to help with pain and quality of life. And here's just another very recent study that came out this month in JAMA showing that medical cannabis patients reported improvements in health-related quality of life and that those improvements were mostly sustained over time. And here's another study looking at anxiety. We're looking at the five-year post-surgical assessment of patients with colorectal cancer and looking to see if there's spread or metastasis five years post-surgery. And although this is uh, for colorectal cancer patients, this can be generalized to all cancer patients. 
And what we see is the patients who did not receive treatment for anxiety, pain, and inflammation, we see 50% of those patients saw a spread in their colorectal cancer five years after surgery. However, only 12.5% of patients saw the spread here if they did receive treatment for anxiety, pain, and inflammation. And that's a really dramatic difference. Now, in this particular study, they used pharmaceuticals to help manage those symptoms. However, we know that these can absolutely be managed with cannabis, possibly psychedelics, meditation, coaching, integration, so many other ways to help manage those symptoms as well. This is a really important study to take a look at. And another study here, looking at the role that psychological distress, anxiety and depression in particular, and how it's a potential predictor of cancer mortality. And I just wanna to touch upon here, the impact that psychedelics may have to bolster our stress resilience and improve quality of life of our patients by providing pain management alongside cannabis medicine. And again, Project CBD way back in 2021, showing how both cannabinoids and psychedelics can contribute to fighting unwanted inflammation that leads to pain and lowered immunity that contributes to a lower quality of life that then leads to progression of disease and mortality. And I wanna close out some of the focus on uh, the psychedelic medicine here with a case study done by Dr. Dustin Sulak. So over the past 15 years, there's been a considerable body of evidence looking at in vitro and in vivo evidence that supports the antineoplastic properties of cannabinoids and more recently of psychedelics. And here we see the reported therapeutic effect of cannabinoids and psychedelics in reducing both tumor proliferation and aiding as a palliative medicine to treat pain and psychological distress associated with cancer and chemotherapy. And again, this is why in addition to medical cannabis educational consultations, I now also offer micro and macro dosing guidance and integration coaching alongside my cannabinoid therapy guidance. I want to close here with a study on the psychoneuroendocrine immunotherapy of cancer. So as we've talked about, attending to the psychological and spiritual health of our patients and clients can help to improve their innate anti-cancer immune activity. And we know that strengthening the immune system leads to better outcomes. Psychological distress leads to a weakened immune system and higher mortality rates. And when we address anxiety related to treatment and or end of life, as well as help strengthen our client's resilience to stress, we improve the possibility of positive outcomes for them. We need to attend to the psychological, emotional, and spiritual health of our patients and clients to improve their immune system and improve their therapeutic outcomes. And this is why in addition to working as a medical cannabis nurse consultant, I chose to become dual board certified in integrative nurse coaching, as well as holistic nursing, so that I can better help my clients and families to address all the surrounding symptoms of their disease states and their ensuing treatments in order to help them achieve better outcomes. I'd like to take this moment to sincerely thank you for spending this time with me today. It's been my privilege to share the benefit of some of my education and experience with you today. And please feel free to reach out with questions or to visit my website, 
at calibricana.com. You can read a little bit more about me and my background and the services I offer. And if you feel called to, to schedule a consultation with me, thank you again for your time today. Thank you so All much. Right. Super, super informative. Thank you. Thank you. There are just a couple of pieces of information that I wasn't able to get into the presentation that I wanted to share with you, and then we can jump in and um, answer some of those questions that you had so, for me. Cool. Um, so first thing is, yes, I see ashwagandha there just popped up. That is one of the great supplements, <laughs> and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So um, first thing I wanted to mention is there is a natural endocannabinoid. Um, it goes by the, the letters PEA. The full name is palmitoyl ethanolamide. And um, PEA can be found in the yolks of eggs as well as in peanuts. Um, you can also find it as a supplement or a topical. But PEA is a natural endocannabinoid. It is not intoxicating in the way that say THC could be. Um, and it's shown some really, really good promise in reducing pain and inflammation, similar to the other cannabinoids that we use, the phytocannabinoids and cannabis to supplement. And so that's another really good addition. You could just add um, eggs to the diet, or if you don't have a peanut allergy, um, that's another food uh, or supplement that you could add to your regimen to try and help get better wraparound care based on your particular diagnosis. And this really works for any type of cancer. Um, so even though a lot of the slides today were specific to glioblastoma, most of those do generalize to high-grade gliomas and a lot of the other um, supplements that we talked about and foods really do help with all forms of cancer. Uh, the one other thing I wanted to mention is something just came out recently um, on Project CBD. And there was a study looking at limonene and THC. And we see that limonene combined with THC helps to potentiate the effectiveness of THC, but possibly allowing us to lower the dose of THC when we add limonene to that regimen. Now, why would that be important? So we already mentioned all the benefits for um, limonene in regard to different types of gliomas and brain cancers, and also other types of cancers, um, breast cancer in particular, it's particularly helpful. But um, when we talk about immunotherapy days, so the challenge is high dose THC on those days might not be advisable. We're still, the jury's out on that one. So it's possible to use lower doses of THC if you were to choose to do so by adding that limonene to your diet, using it um, through inhalation. And of course, Miriam's has the ability to order, excuse me, to offer and add a terpene boost to your medicine. And they can add limonene in there for you or terpenaline in there for you. And so really having limonene on board with THC, we can see the possibility of lowering those THC doses, but still getting a greater therapeutic benefit. So that's something that we just want to, um, I wanted to mention there that's new research. Um, and again, just to mention that terpenes that can be added to your medicine at Miriam. So that's a great way to get those on board as well. Okay. Um, now I'm, I'm going to try to get to um, the questions that I can. Um, I'm going to try to stick to the ones that are related to brain tumors and seizures. Those often go together and that's really the focus of our talk. Um, so we'll, the other ones may have to wait for another time or you can feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, so the first question, um, was regarding the endocannabinoid system. Um, why does THC work for some people and not work for other people? Um, basically, the, the frustrating answer is that each person's endocannabinoid system is unique. And given that we do not at this time have any way to test it, to look for mutations, to test for what we call endocannabinoid tone, how strong is the endocannabinoid system, um, we really have to start with a slow titration and trial and error. And what that means is um, I have some clients who um, they, it seems they might metabolize very slowly. And so they require lower doses of any cannabinoid on board because they, their body really just keeps it active for a longer period of time. 
We see some people who will respond as you saw in the earlier case study, their glioblastoma is responding to CBD alone, 400 milligrams a day. Most people would not respond to just a, a single phytocannabinoid supplementation in addition to traditional treatment. So it's really, dosing is so individualized. It makes it very, very difficult for us to have any sort of protocols that we can just put out there for people to follow. Now, over time, there's the hope that we will be able to have more targeted therapies using phytocannabinoids. But at the moment, um, what I see in my practice, most of my colleagues and what we see in the research is generally speaking, a combination of various cannabinoids. And so with cancer and brain tumors, generally we're looking at CBD, THC, CBG, CBDA, THCA, and sometimes some additional ones like CBN or CBDV in seizures. Um, we generally see the best results when we have a combination of cannabinoids on board in addition to having traditional treatment on board. Now, some people do not respond to cannabinoid therapy at all. That's a fairly small percentage in my experience. We see a lot of people responding. So we see wonderful symptom management. And as you saw just from the talk, managing those symptoms goes a long way to provide therapeutic outcomes. So we have that in place. Symptom management, we know cannabis is extremely, extremely helpful. We see another portion um, of our clients who really see um, tumor stabilization or disease stabilization when we get the cannabinoids on board in therapeutic doses. And when you ask, what are those doses? Again, we always have to start with lower doses. I used, I like to start with single cannabinoid preparation. So a single product that's CBD only. Obviously I prefer using the artisanal full plant, um, whole plant, uh, full spectrum more broad spectrum if you're not able to tolerate THC. Um, we do see that the botanical preparations tend to work better, uh, produce a better therapeutic outcome in much lower doses than isolates or concentrates. And we also see that we have fewer side effects with our clients. So generally speaking, um, to try to answer that question, um, not everyone responds to cannabinoids in general. Some people are going to respond to a certain combination of cannabinoids, same diagnosis. You could try to match the, the patient or the client in almost every way. And one person may do better with a higher uh, preparation or ratio of THC to CBD and CBG. Another may be the complete opposite. And so we do have to be patient and have a little bit of trial and error as we titrate doses in order to get to what we consider a therapeutic dose. Therapeutic dose for symptom management is gonna be a lot lower than if we're looking at the anti-tumor or cytotoxic properties of killing the existing tumor cells. And so it's really important to understand um, what your priorities are in using cannabis. So when someone schedules a consultation with me, not everyone is looking for um, you know, the cytotoxic properties of cannabinoids. Sometimes they really are looking to help manage their symptoms. you have symptoms a 10% off coupon email for anything? The what? Oh. oh, sorry there. I I'm hearing you, Diana, in the background. Okay, so just do I just tell them the reorder coupon code is called reorder? I'm going to try to go ahead and continue here. Um, <clears throat> forgive me. Um, so to, to wrap up that one answer, okay. um, as I said, it's just really important to have some patients have a little bit of trial and error and to recognize that this is not going to work for everyone to yeah, identify you your priorities in terms of what you are wanting um, to use cannabis for as a therapy. And then we kind of go from there. Now, what we do know is that there is a bell-shaped curve in terms of uh, how treatment is, is most beneficial. So too little of cannabinoids on board does not produce a therapeutic effect. What we also know is sometimes too high a dose or combination is not helpful in producing a therapeutic effect. And so that's why we don't immediately nowadays just blast out with really high doses of cannabinoids unless you're using cannabis alone and no other type of traditional treatment. All righty, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, try to move on to one of the other questions. Um, when, when someone is not really a candidate for standard of care, um, traditional chemotherapy, radiation, 
medication and the like, immunotherapy. Um, for glioblastoma in particular, what we saw from the lab study earlier is that that one to four ratio of CBD to CBG tends to be most beneficial in terms of killing differentiated existing glioblastoma um, tumor cells. So that's really important. My recommendation would be to go back and you know watch the recording of this talk today and um, to add the supplements that we talked about. Um, try adding some of those in, the niacin or the curcumin or the get tested for selenium to see if there's a deficiency or adding in the PEA. Um, it's really important not to add everything in at one time because then we really don't know what's producing a therapeutic effect or what be, might be producing a negative side effect. And so I like to, you know, start with your cannabinoids, then try to add one supplement, give it a few days for the body to habituate. I like about a three day time frame. And after those three days, if you're not seeing benefit um, or feeling symptom relief, then we go ahead and increase dosing. Um, if we're looking at cannabinoids and if we're talking about supplements, we're really just making sure you're gonna tolerate them well before you add another supplement on board. So it's really hard. There are a lot of recommendations for supplements out there. Um, I know Dr. Sulak uses um, sometimes a purified citrus pectin. He uses high dose melatonin. Um, I believe he uses um, something called anisetol, um as well. I can kind of get you guys some of that info thereafter. Um, but again, you have to just pick and choose what resonates with you. Start with some of them. If you can add a few on board and you tolerate them, then obviously, hopefully you're getting some better control um, of the disease process. Um, there was a question regarding um, first line temozolomide and second line cannabis therapy. And so absolutely, we do see that adding cannabis with temozolomide and other, um, if at times radiation and having limonene on board as well. All of those on board can be extremely helpful for recurrent glioblastoma. So we're not just talking about a newly diagnosed glioblastoma. So I absolutely do encourage you to add cannabinoids on board, add in some of those therapeutic terpenes um, as well as um, adding them into your diet. So it, it's extremely important. Now, research shows us, um, unfortunately, a lot of my clients end up coming to me as a last resort. And the really important thing, the word to get out is that the sooner you get cannabis on board in conjunction with traditional treatment, the better outcomes you're going to see. So just withholding cannabis for the first three months of treatment of traditional cancer treatment can really affect the outcome and the ability, the therapeutic effect that cannabis can provide. So it's a plant medicine. It takes several months to get it on board in a, at a therapeutic level. And it takes several months before you're gonna be able to look at a scan and see if cannabis has possibly helped with some of the um, therapeutic changes. If for instance, you see stabilization of disease or tumor reduction. So that's something to keep in mind as well. It's not gonna work immediately. You wanna have it on board for several months before you're going to expect to see some changes in the actual tumor activity itself. All righty, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the seizure activities since it's fairly common with brain tumors to um, have concomitant seizures as well. Um, ideally, what I um, have my clients do is um, have uh, lavender oil. So um, someone mentioned earlier in the chat, I believe Young Living or doTERRA are some good um, clean brands that you can use. Um, having lavender oil, we know that the terpene linalol, um, and we see lavender comes from that, can be extremely helpful in reducing seizure activity and sometimes even stopping seizures in their tracks. And so what I have my clients do um, is try and look for a cannabis preparation that has been tested to be high in linalol have linalol added to their medicine as Miriam's can do for you, introduce inhalation of lavender into your daily regimen. And at the first sign of seizure activity, placing the lavender oil beneath the nose is sometimes, believe it or not, enough to be helpful. In addition to that, THC is the most helpful to try and stop a seizure in its tracks. And so oftentimes taking a little bit of THC oil, rubbing it on the in, inside of the gums 
Um, sometimes you can try to use it rectally through a suppository, um, or you can use, if you have what's called RSO or FICO, full extract cannabis oil that's in a thicker paste, you can place that in some rice paper and place that in your, the side of your cheek and try to get some absorption that way. Now, in terms of reducing or trying to prevent seizures, again, having that linalol on board, having CBD on board, uh, we know the addition of CBDV can sometimes be extremely helpful when CBD on its own with sometimes THC and THCA are not enough to stop the seizure activity. And so that's uh, that combination of CBD, THCA, THC, the lavender or linalol, and sometimes the addition of CBDV can be extremely helpful. Um, one important thing to note is there are often potential medication interactions uh, among or between CBD and anti-seizure medications. And some medications, say for instance, if we're looking at Keppra, um, if we give Keppra and CBD at the same time, um, we can see sometimes a 10 to 40% increase in the strength of the Keppra in the body. And so we wanna be careful um, this is, it's a double-edged sword. If you have an epileptologist that you're working with um, for yourself or your child or a family member, um, as long as the levels of the anti-seizure medications are being checked, oftentimes what we can do is the epileptologist can slowly start to taper and lower the doses of, in this instance, Keppra, as we start to increase the doses of CBD and some of those other therapeutic cannabinoids, but CBD in particular. So we wanna be careful knowing that the CBD can increase the effect and the strength of anti-seizure medications. Sometimes they could even lower the strength of those anti-seizure medications. So it's not an exact science, which is why having those blood levels monitored by an epileptologist is extremely important. You never want to be making any changes to those medications on your own. And um, you wanna keep in mind that there can be a potential interaction. I have my clients separate their CBD from their anti-seizure med medications by at least three hours and make sure that they're being monitored at the same time. Um, sometimes a ketogenic diet can be helpful as well. Um, doesn't work for everyone. And that was a question that came up in terms of, you know, do we look at more fruits, nuts, um, beans, legumes? for um, gliomas and glioblastoma, or do we use a keto diet? We don't have any direct comparisons at the moment that I'm aware of. I've had clients on keto. I've had clients on more plant-based. Um, I can't tell you that I've seen um, one outperform the other in terms of therapeutic benefit in my particular practice. So it really just depends. I would um, jump in, try one of them, get it on board, see if it's helpful, at least have it on board for three to six months. And if not, you can go ahead and, and make a switch. Okay. I'm gonna look over here and see if there's anything else. So there were um, some questions about other supplements that can help with the anxiety um, that can really help bolster the immune system so that we reduce anxiety, strengthen the immune system reduce pain and inflammation in the body, which helps with better outcomes. Um, ashwagandha is one supplement. L-theanine can be helpful. Um, passion flower, lemon balm, sometimes rhodiola rosea, sometimes the addition of GABA can be helpful as well. Um, anxiety can also be managed with without supplements or pharmaceuticals, not for everyone, but with a lot of my clients, um, we can introduce awareness practices. We can work with uh, hypnosis a bit to have suggestions that can be extremely helpful. Um, acupuncture, massage, physical activity, um, eating things, um, adding things to your diet that can just strengthen the endocannabinoid system, our natural cannabinoid system, olive oil, omega-3s, um, I referenced earlier, um, melatonin can be helpful as well. Um, so those are some of the um, supplements that you could consider adding in that could be helpful. Um, there was a question uh, or request to talk a little bit more about psychedelics. And so this is a fairly new, um, it's not really new, but a renaissance based on the, the um, crackdown and illegality that happened um, back in the 70s. And so we do see 
just as you can microdose THC, for example, in say doses of maybe um, two to 2.5 milligrams um, throughout the day to help reduce anxiety, to help reduce pain. Um, again, THC in some people can provoke anxiety even in low doses, but for the majority of people, um, the microdosing of THC throughout the day can sometimes help with anxiety and mood. We see the same thing with microdosing psilocybin mushrooms. You can find them um, in places where they're legal in a capsule form, sometimes in a gummy form or a chocolate form. And um, there are a few dosing protocols that you can run through for microdosing of psilocybin mushrooms or the active ingredient. And those can provide a lot of stress reduction help with inflammation, help with pain, help with anxiety, similar to the way that certain cannabinoids can. Now, of course, not only THC can help reduce anxiety and help with mood, we know CBD for certain, we know CBG as well. And so it really just depends, again, on some trial and error to see what is going to work best for you or what combination of cannabinoids and sometimes uh, the psychedelics will work best. And you saw from the, the case study um, of, of Dr. Sulax, um, you know, he worked with a combination of microdosing as well as macrodosing. Macrodosing is going to provide um, a much larger dose of the medicine that is going to create the hallucinations and all of the other properties that we generally hear about with psychedelics. When you microdose psychedelics, particularly the psilocybin mushrooms, um, you're, it's a suboptimal dose. So you should not be experiencing any impairment when you take them. However, you should be experiencing the benefit of reduction in anxiety, pain, and inflammation. The macrodosing can be extremely helpful to reset the brain. So if you're suffering from a lot of chronic pain that's been ongoing for a long period of time, addiction, um, cancer pain, struggling with the anxiety of end of life, you know that's where we really saw the renaissance for the psilocybin coming back into um, our studies and the science was really studies with end of life anxiety for cancer patients. And so a macro dose, uh, one dose, sometimes two over a period of several months, can provide such incredible benefit in reducing anxiety, whether it's related to potential end of life, to treatment. And so there's a variety of combinations. Now, of course, at the moment, we're not having, a, a, these products are not available legally um, in the way that cannabis can be. And cannabis can absolutely work as um, a psychedelic in the way that we, the traditional psychedelics do. So don't discount its ability to um, provide those benefits that the psychedelics can also provide and using them in conjunction with one another can be an even better therapeutic combination. There was a question about, um, can CBD thin the blood? So yes, there's the possibility um, when we see CBD in combination with Coumadin or Warfarin, which is a blood thinner, um, we can see some potential interactions. Um, we can see the potential of CBD thinning the blood. Now, these are theoretical, for the most part, interactions. We have seen them happen um, on occasion. I have not in my practice. Um, the understanding is really that if um, you're concerned about the potential for the thinning of the blood, if you're in a situation where you're getting regular lab draws, this is something where having CBD on board is considered fairly safe. Cannabinoids are non-toxic. We can add them into our treatment and see some great therapeutic benefit. Um, and as long as you're having those labs monitored, you're monitoring your clotting time, whether it's your INR, your PT or your PTT, um, having CBD on board can be very safe. We just want to make sure that those clotting labs are being monitored to make sure that it's safe for you. Uh, the last question that I wrote down before I go back and, and look in the chat, and um, we'll have to stop in just a little bit thereafter, um, was ways to um, how to reduce anxiety. So I I think I did cover those with some of the supplements we talked about and some of the practices. So really it's finding what works for you. So one thing is not gonna work for every single person. Um, massage may be the way to just, just to lower the anxiety in the body and CBG can be really good for that as well. Using acupuncture to just try and help calm the nervous system. 
um, looking at hypnosis can be incredibly beneficial. Um, you can use self-hypnosis or you can work with a practitioner. I use that with some of my clients and patients. Um, things that you're passionate about that give you it for me, going out into nature and hiking, that is something that will lower my stress immediately. So things that are going to bring you joy, that are going to make you laugh, things that you can share um, your sociability with those in your life um, can also be great at providing community and anti-anxiety benefits as well. So you can get them in so many different ways. And I like to provide as much wraparound care for my patients as possible. And so that usually means a combination of traditional uh, Western treatment, cannabis therapy, if you're in a place where psychedelics are legal, or if you wanna make a, uh, a journey to a country where it is legal, considering um, a macrodose in that situation or microdosing if you're in a legal state right now. And again, many, many other areas of the inhalation of uh, lavender oil can be great and having that linalol added to your medicine as well. So I'm just going to pause here and um, see if there are any other questions that I can get to in the next few minutes before we stop. So um, someone did comment and said the nurse that I'm working with had them stop cannabinoids um, while using immunotherapy. This does not line up with the newest research. So again, we have conflicting information. I did the best I could today to at least provide you with some of the facts um, based on the one study that really was providing um, a potential negative outcome in using those together. But keep in mind that when people are talking about cannabis and immunotherapy, and in these studies, mostly what they're referring to is THC and high dose THC. What do I mean when I say high dose, 20 milligrams or higher? So keep in mind, there's the possibility that you can reduce your THC use um, a day or several days prior to your immunotherapy infusion and several days after. Um, the other thing is you can withhold THC and keep the other cannabinoids on board during your treatment. You can choose to withhold all of those for a certain period of time. It really depends on your um, risk tolerance and what resonates with you because we just don't have the science to give a definitive answer. So I tried to provide you with the information and what I advise my clients. Um, Dr. Dustin Sulak, um, he is one of the most prominent cannabis clinicians in the US. And again, his recommendation is to stop two days prior and seven days post immunotherapy infusion. Um, but again, it's really um, up to you based on what you've heard and what you discuss with your treatment team so that everyone is on board with what you're using and what seems to be the, the best combination for you. But again, um, keep in mind, we just talked about that new research of adding limonene to your THC that can allow you to substantially lower your THC doses as well. So the reason THC is the big player is that's where we've seen the potential to lower the immune system with high doses. And that's possible, um, it's happened in breast cancer patients um, and can sometimes happen elsewhere, but that's where we saw it initially happening. And so in that case, uh, we're recommending, you know, 20 milligrams or lower um, for THC, having it on board. And if you add limonene, you can even lower it more than that. Um, again, for myself, um, definitely at least a day prior day of and day after infusion, but that's fairly aggressive um, compared to some of the other recommendations. Okay, I wish I could give you a more concrete answer, um, but unfortunately we just don't have the research yet to support it, but we do see encouraging research that having them together um, can, can be beneficial without creating any harmful effects. Uh, I'm looking here about CBDA. Yes, CBDA, um, the acidic cannabinoids, THCA, CBDA, can be um, very, very helpful adjunctive, adjunctive um, phytocannabinoids to have on board. They tend to be more bioavailable. They work better in lower doses. So CBDA in much lower doses is going to work better than say CBD. Not, they don't do the same thing in the same way, 
However, having a CBDA on board absolutely can be part of your therapeutic plan and definitely what I recommend to um, my clients. I don't necessarily start with that since we don't throw everything um, in the mix right away. I like to start with individual preparations, combine them, see, get to a fairly good therapeutic dose, see where we're at. If we're not seeing the response that we like, then we tweak things. We add in some other cannabinoids. And once we reach a good therapeutic mix, that's when I have my clients um, reach out to Miriam's for to have them create a custom blend for them based on that therapeutic combination of cannabinoids and ratios that we found to be most helpful for you. So that's a really important um, service that Miriam's can offer to you guys, not only in having the ability to create the custom blends and also to add those terpenes. Okay. So someone did ask about the low and high dose of THC. So yeah, I would say five milligrams and under um, the very low dose is 2.5, one to 2.5 milligrams, um, five to 10 is kind of that moderate, maybe 15. Um, and then once you go upwards of 20 milligrams would be, would be considered high. Um, I can tell you just as a general rule of thumb. And um, again, this is very generalized and um, we see people using a combination of cannabinoids uh, for cancer in particular, generally between 10 to 25 milligrams per kilogram per day. Um, now, not everyone even gets close to those numbers, as I said, and if you're using it in conjunction with other types of treatment, chemotherapy, um, radiation, and other um, adjuvant treatments, you might not even need to get, like I said, close to those doses. So um, if we're looking at people who have reduced liver function or kidney function, we're going to be looking at much lower doses as well. So we need to make adjustments based on the individual person and what's going on in their body. Um, but just to throw out kind of a general um, dosing guideline there. Okay, I'm just going to try to get to one more one or two more questions here. Um, so before brain surgery, I tolerated THC well, but after surgery experiencing low high blood pressure and palpitations. So what you wanna keep in mind is when you stop THC um, for more than 48 hours, um, oftentimes your receptors tend to downregulate at that point. And so when you restart THC, you're gonna to wanna to restart at about 25 to 40% lower uh, of a dose than what you had been on prior. And so that's important to keep in mind if you stop your THC um, for immunotherapy or prior to surgery, um, whatever the case may be. Um, now, if you're experiencing fluctuating high low blood pressure and palpitations, um, that's something that's you know serious that needs to be monitored and definitely something you always want to be running this by your healthcare providers. So everything that I'm sharing with you today is based on research, but often this research is in animal studies, lab studies, uh, small um, case studies. So it's very important that you have your providers on board with you so that they have all the information of what you're putting into your body. Um, pharmacists are part of your oncology team. They can look into interactions for you, even though they may not want to, but that is part of their role and they can look for interactions and advise you as, as well. Okay. Um, and so to restart the THC, I would just start at very, very small micro doses, um, monitor those symptoms and slowly try to titrate up. And if that doesn't work, you may need to, at that point, endocannabinoid system may have shifted, your tone may have shifted. And so you may need to look at other cannabinoids to help, um, in addition to THC, um, and you may need to eliminate it at, um, for some people that's the case. Okay. I think this is where I'm going to have to stop today. Um, I did want to let you know, um, and Diana had posted this or Ingrid um, as well. Um, I am offering you um, a fairly substantial discount off of my consulting fees. So um, if you'd like to sign up, just let me know that you are um, attended the webinar today and um, we'll go ahead and make sure that I can get you that discount coupon for your consultation fee. And again, it's truly been my privilege to be with you here today. Um, I hope that I've helped at least introduce a little bit of clarity, although we know the, the new research comes up all the time and it can be conflicting at times. Um, but I do highly encourage you, adults, as well as using cannabis with pediatric patients, it's such a safe medicine for most people and can be extremely effective. 
Um, so don't don't neglect your emotional, spiritual, psychological well-being. Have that on board and just keep um, the positivity, keep a gratitude journal and just keep those things in mind as you're going through treatment. And of course, I'm always here for you as a resource and support as well. Heidi, thank, thank you. you so much, Heidi. That was super, super informative. And um, I know that people have a lot of questions and um, you answered most of them. So thank you so much. Uh, and I know that a lot of people have other questions that Heidi's obviously not able to answer, um, primarily because some of the questions that were asked um, require for her to do a more in-depth um, consultation with the, with the person to be able to give you um, better answers. So that's why I shared her website on the chat. Um, anybody that's interested, um, you can um, contact Heidi and she can set up and you can set up a consultation with her. So once again, thank you so much, Heidi. That was very informative and we really appreciate everything that you do. And thank you for helping many of our customers. Oh, thank you. Take good care.